Thank you, and thanks for the introduction, Leon. Uh, so today, like he said, I'm going to talk about Dask, Dask ML, which is Dask's machine learning library, as well as hyperparameter optimization. I'll explain exactly what the problem I'm trying to solve and how I do it. Uh, but first, I'll introduce myself. Well, I'm Scott Siebert. Uh, I performed this work while interning with Anaconda last summer. Um, this was joint work with both Tom and Tom Augsburger and Matthew Rocklin. Uh, their GitHub handles are there. Uh, uh, Tom is still at Anaconda, but uh, Matthew has since moved on to NVIDIA, where he still does pretty much the same thing. So, uh, and I and I, I have gone back to graduate school, where I uh, where I study machine learning, working on uh, studying closely related problems. So I care a lot about I care a lot about the internet. So I made a tweet about this, and then to my horror, I discovered that Twitter was down 20 minutes ago. Uh, so I, so luckily it's been up in the meantime, and I made a tweet, and so I think you can search the hashtag and find it, but I'm not sure, I'm not certain. If not, uh, here's also a link uh, to these slides, uh, and I care a lot about the internet, right? So this link will also appear on every slide after this. Okay, so today I want to talk about four things. So first I'm going to mention the problem I'm trying to solve and explain why you should care about it. Uh, then say, you know, here's how, here's, Here's the complications of that problem. And then uh, it turns out Dask can bring some exciting opportunities to this problem. Uh, so I'll explain that as well and then uh, say, well, how well does Dask's hyperparameter optimization perform? Okay, so first, so first very basics. Uh, let's start with what is a hyperparameter? So a hyperparameter is a free parameter that is not learned from data. So typically these influence model architecture in some way. So like this might be the depth of your neural network or the depth, of, the depth of your decision tree or something like that. I'll give an example. So let's say we have these eight training points and we say the, the output is related to the input via some polynomial of degree D uh, via, via that. So, so, the, so the degree D is the hyperparameter. So we, so we could do this. So, we, so we, we only have these, these eight training points so fitting is not complex. Uh, so we could say D equals one and uh, and fit the training data exactly. We could say D equals three and have more complex, but it's, it's a choice up to us. We have to decide before any training begins, before we see any training data. Okay, so, so, in some, so by some measures we have to choose, well, we, so we have to choose the best performing hyperparameter uh, from either from the training data or from some unseen validation data. After we see the validation data, we see that D equals three is the right choice. Okay. So this is a simple example. We also have a more complex example, or I'll, I'll show another more complex example. So this is with TSNE, which is a tool you may have heard of. Uh, it does um, some dimensionality reduction, and the author, or the, um, I, I maybe should have mentioned UMAP because the, <laughs> anyways, anyways. Uh, so, so what TSNE does is it reduces from high dimensions to low dimensions. It does some dimensionality reduction. This is most useful to, most useful to visualize your data. So let's say we have a bunch of, uh, so I showed an example on the right there. Let's say we have a bunch of 28 by 28 images of handwritten digits. I, and so, so because they're in 28 by 28 and the features are just the pixels, uh, they're all 784 dimensions. Uh, I'm not sure that's required, that many, that many features. Why? Because mo a lot of the pixels are white and all the threes look pretty much the same. So it'd be nice to represent all of these with each example with two features, which is what is shown there. TSNE is the tool to go from 800 features to two features. This paper is titled How to Use TSNE Effectively. It's by some authors at Google, at Google Brain and uh, Google, Google Cloud. And the first section, the first section of their paper is titled Those Hyperparameters Really Matter. And in this section, they, they show a basic hello world of TSNE. So they say, uh, we'll give you a well two well-defined clusters in two dimensions, and we'll ask, you, we'll ask TSNE to project that to two dimensions again. This is like the simplest, like, of course TSNE should be able to handle this. While they're doing this, they, they, they decide to vary one hyperparameter, the perplexity. So of course I looked on the scikit-learn documentation page, and, the, and they're either, they're, what they recommend is that perplexity should be between five and 50, and more complex, uh, spaces in the higher dimensional feature space, more complex classes in the higher dimensional feature space should perhaps have a, um, a higher perplexity. So, 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 so these authors vary between two and 100, just to go a little outside that range, and they see that the model depends pretty drastically on what the value of perplexity is. 
And so, so this perplexity value uh, influences the architecture of this estimator. There are two other hyperparameters like this, uh, early exaggeration and metric, both influence the, the model architecture. There are three more, whoops. So there are three more, the learning rate, uh, number of iterations, and initialization that are to control the optimi optimization method and really shouldn't be specified by the user. Because the, the, the optimization process can't handle whatever this is. Okay, so then what is hyperparameter optimization? So hyperparameter optimization is finding the best values for those six hyperparameters. And this is in terms of validation accuracy, so you know, the, maybe the unsupervised example isn't the best, but this might be some test set that we hold later till the end or something. My claim uh, that I'll make in this talk, and I'll show evidence and all that, is that DaskML will do this process faster and more efficiently and find better hyperparameters. I'll back this up. First, so, to go back all the way to the beginning, let's start at the basics. Uh, so first of all, are there any questions, or what questions are there? Okay, all right, so, so back to the basics. So what else is out there? So, so, what, so what are the algorithms that solve this hyperparameter optimization problem and can, and can find the best set of hyperparameters? So the most popular one uh, is, red, is implemented in scikit-learn's randomized search CV. Uh, it does, it's, it's a very basic, simple algorithm, which is a feature, actually. Uh, so all it does is it picks a random, a random hyperparameter, initializes the model with, that, with those hyperparameters, and then trains that model to completion. Then for, so it, so it trains, so in this case, it trains four models to completion. From these four models, it, it tests on the validation sets, and then reports, reports the best validation performance as the best set of hyperparameters. This is great. This has, uh, it's very simple and it's very easy to use. Uh, and it's a super simple limitation, so things like job web and things like that can be useful. This is nice. So I'm actually doing this in my day job right now. Uh, I have, I'm, so I'm using scikit-learn's randomized search CV to do whatever I want inside FITS. I'm doing something with GPUs and CUDA and uh, deep nets and all that, whatever. Uh, it's super nice because now, I, so I can use scikit-learn's implementation on top of this. This is nice. The one downside is that, the, that there's no limits in computation. So, so, so it trains all four models into completion. This is annoying because we, we only care about one set of hyperparameters, the best set of hyperparameters, the best performing set of hyperparameters. We don't care about the second best, not the third best, and definitely not the worst. But we train all those to completion. <laughs> this is annoying, especially if these models have already converged. Uh, there can be some internal stopping, but still, it's uh, just trained to completion. There's no inter interdependence between the, between the models. It turns out if you look at all the searches out there, that the, the search will always be computationally significant. Um, there'll, there'll always be a, uh, a fair amount of search. So what my goal was, was to, uh, was to have these same features in Dask, or it was to bring a better hyperparameter optimization algorithm to Dask. Uh, it turns out that randomized search CV is pretty nice, but there's no limits on computation, so I focused on that. Right, so, so the questions I asked were, what algorithm should be implement, implemented in Dask ML, that's Dask's machine learning, machine learning library again, and why is it well suited for Dask? How can, it, uh, how can Dask help this algorithm? So for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, what Dask is is a tool that natively scales Python. Um, this is a one-site introduction to Dask. Uh, but, so what it does is you, if you have some local Python process that you run on your own machine, you can scale uh, I think out to giant data sets or up to uh, more clusters. I might have the up and out backwards, as well as both of those. Uh, so this is super nice. Uh, this is a very useful tool. Dask is not the only thing like this. Um, so, or I should give an example. So, so if you have, so if you have some local Python process that can run, that can read a pandas CSV on your own machine. Uh, Dask has a Dask has tools to help you scale out to read, you know, every CSV in some directory or something, something like that, as well as out to more computational distributed computing. So there are other tools like this, things like Spark, Hadoop, MPI, all these. So these all provide the same set of features. Dask's main selling points are the fact that it's easy to use, declarative, and it has a nice di diagnostics page. I'll explain what each of these mean. So it's easy to use. So so what Dask tries to do is try to, is try to mirror the rest of the SciPy stack. And so it's things like, uh, 
like, like, like if you can read a pandas CSE with easily with you know pandas read CSV function, well it turns out there's a DAS data frame called function called read CSV that can read you know 10 CSVs or 100 CSVs or 1,000 CSVs. Doesn't matter. That's a drop-in replacement. It acts the same as panda as pandas read CSV. So it's also it's also easy to scale out to more some more computation. So so my first experience with with DAS was I had I had some local Python process on my own machine that used NumPy to do some simulations. I wanted to repeat these, uh, you know, a thousand times for some, for, for some experiments. So what I did was I added, one, I added two lines and changed one, and boom, I could run, and run one command on the cluster, and I could run 240 jobs of these in parallel on my university's system. In this talk, I'll be focusing on limiting the computation that DAS does for hyperparameter optimization. That's my focus. N not so much on the larger data sets. Okay, so that's my focus is uh, is to limit computation for for hyperparameter selection. Hyperparameter selection. Scikit learn Scikit learns randomized search CV has a lot of nice features, uh, but it but it doesn't limit computation. So the question I'll ask is how can that be limited? So early stopping is the easiest method to do that. Uh, so here I say let's stop half of the models halfway through, uh, and that saves on 25% of the computation. Uh, this is nice because with high probability, those bottom two models are not the highest performing models. You know, and you know if we evaluate the second, and maybe the second best is. So so naturally this requires uh, some partial fit implementation of the scikit learn uh, scikit learn scikit learn implementation or the warm start. Uh, some way to continue training. I should mention as well that uh, that Dask already has some of this, uh, some limits on computation uh, through uh, so so they so they so the the Dask ML implementation of randomized search CV mirrors the scikit-learn documentation, but it uses some fancy things to limit computation in certain special cases. These special cases typically involve uh, pipelines and natural language processing. I can talk more offline, uh, and this is work to the this is thank you to the work by Jim Christ. Okay, so it turns out there's an algorithm out there that does this. Uh, that it's, so, so this algorithm hyperband is a principled early stopping scheme for random hyperparameter selection. So it's, a, it's the same as randomized search EV in every way, except that it stops some models at some times. And there's more, de there's more detail in the paper by Kevin Jamison. It's long, it's 53 pages. Um, their main result is uh, is summarized by this corollary that I wrote. This summarizes two pages of their of two pages of their paper. And what it says is that uh, that hyperband will outperform random hyper hyperparameter selection by a fair fair amount. It says this, and they have math behind it. They have 53 pages of math behind this. Uh, they they spend a long time proving this with minimal with minimal assumptions. Uh, it's fairly complex, and actually, what I summarize here is a a summary of what they proved. What they show in this 53 pages, on one of these 53 pages, is that this is actually close to the lower bound, the, the best you could ever hope to do, uh, the the lower bound on the number of resources used to find a good performing model, at least with high probability. Okay, so. So now there are some qualifications. So first of all, uh, this is an infinite version of hyperband. So the training continues forever. So we can remove all the constants and we only look at the rates. The rates are the, I can't really point with my thing, but uh, you see like one over max of alpha and beta and alpha plus beta. Those are the rates and hyperband converges at a much faster rate. This means that the score increases a lot faster or the loss decreases a lot faster either way. And then uh, the, the, the time variable here is, you know, the, is T, which is in, like the number of partial fit calls. Okay, if you want more details, I encourage you to read uh, the paper by Kevin Jamison, this 53 pages. Uh, they, they, so they claim that this, the, the statement on how well Hyperman does in the infinite case uh, generalizes pretty well to the finite case. They leave that as an exercise, exercise to the reader, uh, and I do the same thing to you. Okay, but so, all right, so, so, so they, they spend 53 pages, you know, actually proving their thing, but the intuition is pretty simple. So, so Hyperman is some early stopping scheme. It, is, it decides to stop some models at some times. So, you know, so here we'll stop the bottom two models halfway through. 
However, this stopping of some models depends on one parameter. It depends on how important the training data is, or conversely, how important the hyperparameters are. So if only the training data is important, it, can, it only makes sense to train models to completion, nothing else. What else would you do? I mean, if, so if, if, the hyperparameter, if, 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 the hyper, if the hyperparameters you put in do nothing, there's nothing else you, that you could hope to do. Conversely, uh, if, if the training data is not very important and the hyperparameters matter a lot more, uh, it makes sense to have some very aggressive early stopping schedule and train at least one model to completion. So then, so, so notice that all of, these, all of these brackets that determine training, training data importance uh, do the, sa the same, amount, same amount of work. And what Hyperband does through a trick they call the doubling trick uh, is they, 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 they sweep over, this, over these different brackets. So they run all these brackets in parallel, absolutely in parallel. Uh, and and there's, some, there's a theorem in machine learning that says that if you uh, do, this, do this doubling trick, that the loss is not too much worse, or the regret is not too much worse than if you had just run the optimal one. To make this clear, this is implementation, uh, more or less. Uh, so the first thing to note is that there, the brackets are run completely in parallel. Typically there's uh, between four and six of these. And uh, yeah, they're run completely in parallel here with a, with a, um, a list comprehension. Then each one of these jobs does an early stopping scheme for randomized search TV. So it trains a bunch of models in parallel, and then at certain times it, deci it decides to stop a certain number of models. Okay, so that's hyperbands. So, so, le so let's look at what we wanted. It has uh, a simple implementation, uh, and it, it has mathematical justification to limit the computation, which is nice. The, it's also e easy to parallelize with a star next to it. Uh, I, put it in, I, put, I put this in yellow because uh, the, the number of models decrease for, for any bracket, they decrease as time goes on. However, these brackets are run completely in parallel, so maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Okay, so, so, I've so I've implemented Hyperband in Dask ML, and this is how you import it. So now I'm gonna talk about what input, like how do you use it, well, and how, how, you know, how does it perform? I'll examine these two questions. Uh, so to my knowledge, this is the, the first implementation of Hyperband in an in, 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 in advanced task scheduler like Dask. So I'll do that by going through one example, uh, this example will be on my own laptop with a scikit-learn model. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll use this syn synthetic data set. I'll add four other uh, dimensions just to, that are random noise, but these are the two informative, informative dimensions. Uh, the colors correspond to different class labels. And I'll use scikit-learn's neural network, their MLP classifier. So my search space is this, but um, the only important part is that uh, only one hyperparameter controls the model, the, the model architecture. All the other parameters control finding the model, the best model of that architecture. Okay. So here's how you use it. So it's a, so Hyperman, of course, needs more parameters than, uh, than just the model and the parameters that you wanna search over, hyperparameters you wanna search over. It also requires the number, the number of examples that you want the longest trained model to see as well as the number of approximately the number of parameters that you want to sample. So here I say let's let's train for 50 epochs or passes through the, through the data, and let's sample about 300 parameters. With those, we can we can determine the chunk size for the Dask array, as well as the Hyperman's max iter. The the chunk size for the Dask array determines how many examples each partial fit call sees. So we can. So we can make our hyperband. Uh, there's a mistake here. I didn't. The patience equals true is supposed to be on a later slide. Ignore it. Uh, so so we can make our hyperband search CV and we can call fit. With that, we uh, well we can launch our model selection process or our hyperparameter optimization process. And so we can see the dash the dash dashboard you know actively working. We can see that the um, that the implementation includes a verbose flag and we can see that print out. It's super nice. I said before that the number of parameters was approximate, the, or the, the number of example, the number of parameters you wanted the example was approximate. The metadata, the metadata, the metadata attribute includes exactly how much information will be will be will be performed. 
This class also uh, mirrors randomized search CV, so it has all the same attributes. So this is uh, things like best, best estimator, best params, best scores, best score, all of that. Okay, so, so this has finished running now. Uh, so how well did this perform? So I actually ran this 200 more times in parallel. Not in parallel. Uh, 200 more times. I did 200 searches, 200, 200 things of uh, 200 runs of Hyperband, as well as 200 runs of randomized search CV, more or less. And I see that Hyperband. So in this first plot here, I'm plotting the uh, the final val final validation accuracy after the that this is in best score, as well as the number of times it's a histogram, right? And I see that Hyperband tends to find values around 0 0.9. That's the score that it finds, so 90% accuracy. Uh, for, the same, for the same amount of work, randomized search CV finds uh, less, um, it's less certain, it, there's more var variability. All right, so I, and it turns out the, the worst performing of the Hyperband runs did better than 50% of the randomized search CV runs. So I got curious and I was like, well, how did this go throughout time? Like how many passes through the, through the data do you need to uh, to get a value of, to, to get a particular accuracy. And to see that on average, uh, you need uh, three times fewer passes through the data to, get, to reach a model of 85% accuracy. Here, the, the, the green line, the dotted green line represents, so, so, these, so these experiments are run on, a, on four cores, and the green line re represents the time, the passes through the data required, the passes through the data required to reach, to train four models uh, to completion. Okay, so, so, so in these experiments, I can see that Hyperband finds, is much more confident in the values it finds, um, as well as it requires about a third of the data to actually get there, to get to a particular accuracy. Okay, so, so it turns out Hyperband is very parallel, uh, and it's, it's ready to be used by an advanced task scheduler. Uh, but then, but how, how can Dask help Hyperband? Uh, so, so it turns out Dask is an advanced task scheduler, and one feature DAS supports, uh, DAS distributed supports at least, is assigning, so is assigning priority to different jobs. So if you have 200 jobs to run and only five slots to do it, uh, DAS can say, DAS will allow you to select, a, to select a, assign priorities to different jobs to choose which job gets run first. Okay, so what I've done is I've assigned uh, the priority to be the scores, uh, the model's last score. So higher models get higher priority, or higher performing models get higher priority. So to show this, I, I did one run of hyperbands. This one, so I'm showing the same thing. Uh, I'm showing the number of passes through, through the data versus validation accuracy. Uh, so, so this plot is for the same run of hyperband. Everything is the same except how Dask prioritizes models. So the same models, same parameters, same uh, like all, like same 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 internal random state of everything is exactly the same. The only thing that's different is how Dask. Uh, does the prior prioritization scheme. So, what, so the, the dotted line is uh, the FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, this is DASK's default. Uh, and the solid line is when you assign models, higher priority to models with higher scores. And we see that you know, uh, prioritizing models with higher scores gives, uh, finds validation accuracies a lot quicker. Um, I, I ran this plot seven times, and I choose this plot to be like, representative of the seven samples. I should mention that, uh, that serial, serial, serial environments matter, uh, benefit the most from this because, because, that, because that's when priority matters the most. If you had an infinite number of workers, there'd be no, no sense of priority because every job could run it every time. Okay, so my second example is perhaps more realistic. Uh, it uses um, a deep learning model, a shallow deep learning model with PyTorch, and it tries to see how well Dask, uh, Dask scales. So. Um, so, so everything is the same up, up to the number of workers. So, so in this, I'll, I'll be denoising some images. This is a complicated data set. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, but the, the model I'll use is one through PyTorch. It'll be an autoencoder. This is like four, a four or five layer neural network. For those, for those unfamiliar, PyTorch is very, is very similar to TensorFlow. Uh, but in my opinion, it's a little nicer to use. And here's my search space. Again, no time to go through it. Uh, and here are the parameters that I uh, accidentally copy and pasted paste on the, onto the other slide. Um, notice that I say patient, patient equals true because maybe I want to do some extra, some extra just double checking to make sure that I don't have diverging models or something. 
So what this says is, if the if the tolerance, if the model model score doesn't improve by tolerance within a certain number of a certain window, then that model should be killed as well. Uh, and patience equals true uh, chooses a good value of that window to make that works well with hyperbands. Talk to more talk to more talk to me offline if you want to learn more. And so with that, we see this. Uh, we see that as the number of workers, so everything is the same except for the number of workers. Uh, and I'm, I'm plotting the time in seconds to to finish the computation. And as the number, as, so there's a big difference between eight, eight and 16 workers. There's less of a difference between 24 and 32 workers. And if you if you actually map this out and look at the look at you know at, at, you know when the speed up saturate, it turns out that for this experiment at least, hyperband saturates around 16 to 24 workers, somewhere in that range. Okay. So so that's about all the time I have. Here's the summary slide. Uh, so uh, so so. So these, so these are the points I just mentioned on the earlier slide. That Dask will find these hyperparameters more quickly, uh, with less that with le less with less passes through the data, uh, and with more more confidence and all of that. Uh, so yeah, so so Dask ML's hyper hyperparameter optimization will find high performing hyperparameters quickly. Hyperband helps is ready for Dask, and Dask is ready for hyperbands. Um, this code is available through Dask ML, Dask machine machine learning library. Uh, documentation installation is right there. That's all I have time for. Are there what questions do you have? This is really cool. I've been following your work on PRs mm -hmm. when, you, when you merged this. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think I know you're good at Bandle. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? You showed hyperopt. Have you tried your success of having, and is it better or worse? I, I haven't done any integration experiments. I've, I've, only, I've only shown experiments with, with randomized search CV. It turns out hyperband is, um, is a, a scheme to stop models early for, hyper, for random, 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 hyper, random hyperparameter selection. There's nothing Bayesian or anything about that about it. You can do more with that. Um, that's, I guess, an area of future work. Okay. All right, there are no further questions. Let's, uh, let's thanks God again.